Welcome to the eerie and twisted world of Tales from the Crypt Comics, a chilling anthology that has sent shivers down the spines of readers for decades. These macabre tales, originally published in the 1950s by EC Comics, are a haunting blend of horror, suspense, and dark humor that have become iconic in the world of graphic storytelling. Each story, introduced by the Crypt Keeper, the old cackling and undead host, offers a new glimpse into the macabre and the grotesque. With its intricate artwork and bone-chilling narratives, Tales from the Crypt has left an indelible mark on the horror genre, inspiring countless films, television series, and other media adaptations. So, if you dare to peer into the abyss of the unknown, join us as we delve into 16 scariest tales from the crypt, where horrors beyond imagination await your arrival. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. The Living Corpse In the dimly lit cryptic city morgue, Jed Bryant, the morgue's attendant, treads through the routine of his night shift. The routine shatters when an eerie body discovered in the back alley arrives for examination. As Jed sits by the lifeless form as he typically does, the corpse springs to life, hands lunging at his throat from beneath the cover. A desperate cry for help falls silent as air dwindles, and Jeb succumbs to darkness. Upon awakening, he finds the body missing and a sense of horror gnawing at his consciousness. The journey home is an agonizing march through relentless nightmares. Battling his fears, Jed returns for the next night's shift, only to face a similar ghastly assault from another reanimated corpse. Tim, a colleague, finds him the next morning, urging Jed to seek medical help. Yet, the fear of disbelief stifles his confession. Attempting solace, Jed attends a magic show, seeking distraction from death's grip. There, he witnesses Satanus, a magician performing an unnerving act of aquatic endurance. Jed's fear of mortality haunts him, compelling him to confront his anxieties back at work. A chilling newspaper revelation links Satanus to a missing partner, Desiree, whose lifeless body graces the morgue, bearing a cryptic snake mark. Soon after, another body arrives, adorned with a snake-marked ring, revealing Satanus in a twisted state. The malevolent magician attacks, but Jed's resolve prevails, incapacitating Satanus. A desperate attempt to ensure Satanus's demise turns fatal as both succumb to their fate, echoing within the morgue's cold, desolate walls. The chilling screams of a malevolent magician and the final throes of a tormented attendant resonate, etching their demise into the cryptic annals of the city's morgue. Bargain in Death In the cool October evening of 1928, within the dormitory of Loganwood Medical College, two dejected young students, Mel and Sid, sat sullenly pondering their predicament. Lab fees were due, and without them, their anatomy course involving dissecting cadavers seemed out of reach. Sid proposed an outrageous solution conducting their own anatomy course, which meant exhuming a fresh corpse from the town cemetery. Meanwhile, across town, George and Alex faced their own desperate situation. With a need for money pressing upon them, Alex pitched an audacious plan to George, using a drug that could mimic death. George could take his own life temporarily, allowing Alex to claim the life insurance money and split it with him. Though hesitant, George eventually agrees, and they set the plan in motion. The next morning, George's landlady discovered his lifeless body, seemingly a victim of heart failure. George's funeral was swiftly arranged, and he was laid to rest. Back at the medical college, Mel and Sid made a pact with a local gravedigger named Clem, who agreed to help them for a fee. They planned to dig up George's body the night after the funeral. However, as the night fell, unexpected events transpired. Alex, on his way out of town with the insurance money and unaware of the grave robbing scheme, was involved in a high-speed car chase that led him to the cemetery where George was buried. 
In a frantic attempt to avoid hitting Mel and Sid, he crashed the car into the cemetery fence. As they regrouped and paid Clem for his services, they returned to their dorm, only to discover George's lifeless body on the floor. It turned out that Clem had taken matters into his own hands and murdered George with a crowbar. In a bizarre twist of fate, both sets of students had their problems solved, but not in the way they had intended. Mel and Sid found their cadaver, albeit in a shocking manner, and Alex secured the insurance money. However, their lives had taken dark and unexpected turns that fateful night, leaving them all with haunting memories they would never forget. Midnight Mess in the quiet village, the steeple clock marked the change of time as Harold arrived. He searched for his sister's house on Short Street, but found an eerie emptiness, a deserted square, and the cryptic warning of an old man about vampires. Dismissing the absurdity of the claim, Harold ventured into a restaurant, baffled by its inexplicable openness at night. The locals, however, seemed unfazed. Suspicion arose when Harold noticed his meal's peculiar saltiness and strange names for ordinary dishes like blood juice cocktail and hot blood consommé. The unsettling reflection in the restaurant's mirror revealed Harold as the sole human amidst a gathering of vampires. Panic surged when Donna, his own sister, admitted to being one of them. Donna explained that in modern times, vampires left the hunting and preparation of their victims to professionals like this restaurant. She revealed the horrifying truth that they had chosen him as the next meal. As Harold was bound and helpless, each vampire took their turn, sipping his blood with sinister satisfaction. In this town, they dined like connoisseurs, savoring various blood dishes. Donna's chilling revelation left Harold at the mercy of the ravenous crowd. He couldn't escape the fate of becoming a part of their insane Insidious Feast Murder Dream Howard's nights were haunted by a recurring nightmare, a relentless horror that gripped his soul. In his dream, he watched helplessly as his beloved wife, Kathy, faced the imminent threat of murder. Beads of sweat clung to his furrowed brow every morning as he awoke shaken to the core. The story of Howard and Kathy unfurled in poignant flashbacks. They had acquired a charming new house with a caretaker named Claude. A career opportunity had beckoned Howard to London, and with a heavy heart, he left Kathy in Claude's capable hands. As the nightmare continued, a sinister truth emerged. Howard's relentless fear wasn't for Kathy's safety, but for her life in the presence of Claude. His dream depicted Claude as the would-be murderer. Driven by this harrowing vision, Howard rushed back home determined to protect Kathy. The eerie silence of the house was broken only by Kathy's mournful sobs. She sat brokenhearted beside a casket containing Howard's lifeless body. In a shocking twist, it was revealed that Claude had been living Howard's nightmare all along. Obsessed with Kathy since she moved in, he had murdered Howard to be with her. Unable to control his dark desires, he finally succumbed to the madness and arrived to kill Kathy, too. As the truth unfurled, Howard's nightmare had become a gruesome reality that had consumed them all. Drawn and quartered Max Moore, a talented yet helpless painter, found himself in the city of Port-au-Prince, Haiti. His spirit had been crushed by a series of unfortunate events. His art dealer, Arthur Green, had failed to sell any of his paintings, and the devastating critique from art critic Fenton Breedley had left Max feeling like a failure. In a desperate move, Max sold all his cherished paintings at a small amount to art collector Lawrence Diltant on Arthur's recommendation. However, fate had more in store for Max than he could have imagined. A chance encounter with his old friend Bob Dickinson revealed the shocking truth. Fenton Breedley had actually given Max glowing reviews, and Arthur Green had duped him into selling his precious works for a small sum while they fetched thousands of dollars in the United States. Enraged and seeking revenge, Max borrowed money from Bob and sought help from an old native of the island delving into the mystical world of voodoo. To his astonishment, he discovered that his newfound voodoo powers connected his paintings to their subjects. 
If he altered a painting, the same alteration would befall the subject. This revelation turned Max into a formidable force, though a self-portrait he had made of himself right before discovering his powers can lead to his undoing. Determined to avenge himself, Max returned to the United States, rented his old studio apartment, and safeguarded his self-portrait, realizing that any harm to it would mean his own demise. Max's vengeance began subtly but escalated quickly. He sketched his landlord and erased his legs, causing a terrible accident that led to amputation. Fenton Breedley's portrait followed, with Max erasing his eyes, resulting in Fenton's wife retaliating with acid to his face. Arthur Green's hands were next, leading to a gruesome encounter with a mat cutter. But Max's crest for revenge took an unforeseen turn. As he stashed his self-portrait in a closet with a skylight, disaster struck. A sign painter accidentally kicked a can of turpentine, causing it to fall through the skylight and damage the portrait. Simultaneously, Max had a tragic end under the wheels of a subway train. Taint the meat! It's the humanity! In the quiet town before World War II, Zack Gristle was just an ordinary butcher unnoticed by most. However, when meat rationing, red points, and ceiling prices came into play during the war, Zack's life took a dramatic turn. One morning, a long line of 40 folks awaited Zack's butcher shop. His popularity had skyrocketed, driven by the scarcity of meat and the strict rationing rules. Red points became the coveted currency for meat, and Zack was the only supplier in town. But despite the demand, Zack remained an honest man. When customers ran short on red points, he refused to compromise his integrity. Mrs. Winkle, Mr. Russell, Mrs. Dickey, and others left disappointed. However, temptation eventually knocked on Zack's door in the form of a black market operation. He started selling horse meat to the town's residents, while still serving those willing to pay extra with his remaining red points. His life seemed to improve. Yet the black market grew, and Zack found himself involved in shady deals. He even began selling tainted meat, unaware of the dire consequences. People in town started getting sick, and tragically, some died. The news of poisoning spread like wildfire, and fear gripped the town. Zack realized the gravity of his actions, and panic drove him to flee. He decided to flee with his black market earnings, leaving behind his once thriving butcher shop. As Zack came back home to get his earnings, his wife, Mrs. Gristle, confronted him. She accused him of being a murderer after their son came back home sick being fed the tainted meat at a friend's house, and in her anger, she butchered Zack to death. The next day, when a customer came to the shop, the display had Zack's meat, while Mrs. Greffel revealed the terrible truth about the tainted meat. Mirror, mirror on the wall. In a haze of confusion and disorientation, an unnamed person awoke from what felt like an eternal slumber. A mysterious figure stood beside them, offering reassurance amidst the unknown. The reassurance turned to dread as the person realized they were bound to a chair, belts confining them. Summoning strength and determination, they managed to break free and fled into a nearby carnival. But the revelry turned to horror as a sea of faces screamed in terror at the sight of them. Panicked, they sprinted towards an empty road, desperate for escape. A passing car only escalated the terror when the driver, upon seeing them, succumbed to sheer horror and shock. Events took a tragic turn as the person unintentionally caused the driver's demise, setting off a chain of events that would forever alter their lives. Memories flashed back, revealing the person's identity as Arthur Stone. The path led to a nearby house belonging to Arthur and his wife Nancy. However, their reunion turned fatal as Nancy, terrified by Arthur's appearance, met a tragic end. In a quest for answers, Arthur confronted the mysterious figure, learning the ghastly truth. He was a creation, a patchwork of bodies with Arthur's brain, the brain of the original Arthur Stone who had passed away. Consumed by rage and grief, Arthur sought vengeance, ending the creator's life. Further horror awaited as Arthur encountered his monstrous reflection, Frankenstein's creation. A chase through a maze of mirrors ensued, culminating in a final confrontation that extinguished the last flicker of life within Arthur. 
the ventriloquist dummy. Larry Douglas, the entertainment director of the White Lake Hotel, had a promising offer for retired ventriloquist Charles Jerome, hoping to bring his once-renowned act back to life. Larry knocked on Charles's door, but when it opened, he was met with rejection, though Charles still wore a black mitten, hiding his left hand, which had been the secret behind his ventriloquism. Flashbacks flooded Larry's mind, memories of a time when Charles had a warm smile and sparkling eyes. Charles had stopped performing after a gruesome incident. A female dancer had died mysteriously during his last show, her body seemingly torn apart by rats. A day before the scheduled performance, Charles agreed to perform at the hotel. The audience was captivated, and Larry couldn't believe his luck. However, strange things began to happen. Larry overheard an argument between Charles and the voice he used for his dummy, Morty, as they fought over a woman Morty had flirted with during the act. Disturbed, Larry investigated a commotion, only to discover the woman's lifeless body, bearing marks from sharp-toothed animals like rats. Panic set in as he rushed back to Charles's room, finding it empty, except for a suitcase containing Morty's headless body with some makeup. A scream from the kitchen led Larry to Charles, who wielded a cleaver. In horror, Larry saw that Charles had severed his left hand, a grotesque, deformed head lying on the side. Charles confessed that the hand had formed years ago and could talk by itself, and it had also taken control over him, causing the deaths of the women. Larry raced to find a doctor, but it was too late. The severed hand had torn Charles's body to shreds. There was an old woman. Aunt Tildy, an elderly woman with wisps of gray hair, lived alone in a cozy cottage. One afternoon, a mysterious man in black visited her. Annoyed by the intrusion, she assumed he was a salesman and ordered him to leave. But as the man's sorrowful eyes met hers, Aunt Tildy sensed something was amiss. She asked him to wait for Emily, a name that had been etched in her memory for years. Puzzled, she retired for a nap. When Aunt Tildy woke up, the man in black was preparing to leave with a group of others carrying a wicker casket. Panic overcame her as she demanded they leave immediately. Moments later, Emily arrived, trembling at the sight of Aunt Tildy. She asked her not to be afraid. Determined, she then hurried to the mortuary. There, a shocking revelation awaited. Aunt Tildy was a ghost and the wicker casket contained her body. In a fury, she threatened Mr. Carrington, the mortuary owner, with haunting his establishment for two centuries if her body wasn't returned. Fearing her wrath, he agreed, and Tildy reclaimed her body and returned home, ensuring no man in black would ever disturb her again. Cayman's Calamity Bill and Al, the editors of Entertaining Comics, reminisced about the early days when they dabbled in romance comics. The magazine had Jack Kamen, an old friend of Al's, join as an artist. Jack's drawings were sweet and sincere, perfectly suited for romance. However, losses piled up, and only a few horror magazines sold at a profit. Facing financial ruin, Bill and Al decided to shift their focus entirely to horror. They asked Jack to adapt his art accordingly, but he struggled to capture the necessary fear. Frustration grew, and one evening, after repeated failed attempts, Jack stormed home, determined to transform his art. In the moon's eerie glow, an overwhelming determination to kill consumed him, and he committed a heinous act against a stranger. Returning home, he harbored the same sinister intentions for his wife and children. But just as the darkness seemed inescapable, a twist revealed it was all a nightmare in Jack's mind. The next day, Jack decided to resign, but Bill and Al pleaded with him to stay. They agreed to pay him fairly, recognizing his potential in horror. It was the pivotal moment when Jack came and got his first taste of true horror, which he would eventually master and incorporate into his work, shaping the future of the comic industry. Tatter up! Tony Barrett, driven by greed, married Fanny in the hopes of inheriting her fortune of a hundred grand. However, as weeks passed with no sign of the promised wealth, his patience wore thin. 
Tony contemplated leaving, but before he could, Fanny unveiled her secret. The fortune would be his once she passed away in a few years. Tony reluctantly agreed to stay. One day, he encountered a ragman who frequented Fanny's house to purchase rags. Suspicion gnawed at Tony, suspecting that the ragman had tipped him off about Fanny's supposed wealth. Tony waited for Fanny to leave the house on her daily rag-collecting trips and began searching every corner. His obsession grew until one fateful day when he decided to murder Fanny and bury her in the attic. After the grisly act, Tony scoured the house for the elusive fortune but found nothing. Meanwhile, the ragman persisted in visiting, claiming Fanny was on an extended journey. Eventually, Tony discovered the ragman emerging from the attic and confronting him about Fanny's lifeless body. The ragman confessed to spreading the rumor of Fanny's wealth because he wanted her happiness, which he could never provide. Terrified, Tony shot the ragman, but to his shock, the bullets had no effect. The ragman was not made of flesh and bone, but composed entirely of rags. As Tony gasped for breath, the ragman's cloth-like appendages closed in, choking him to a gruesome demise. Reflection of Death As the sun dipped below the horizon, Al felt the weight of exhaustion settle upon him. He had been driving for hours with his friend Carl by his side, and the wariness of the day had finally caught up with him. Al's eyelids grew heavy, and he struggled to stay awake. Seeing Al's struggle, Carl decided to take the wheel, allowing his friend to get some much-needed rest. Al nodded his gratitude and soon drifted into a fitful slumber. However, his peaceful rest was short-lived. Abruptly, Al was jolted awake on the side of a dark, unfamiliar road. He couldn't remember how they got there. Confused and disoriented, he stumbled towards an approaching car, hoping for help. To his bewilderment, the driver of the car took one look at him and fled in terror. Al's attempts to communicate with others met with the same reaction, fear and flight. He couldn't understand what was happening. Desperation set in, and after more eerie encounters, Al finally managed to find a car to drive home. But when he arrived, two long months had passed since the accident. He rushed to Carl's house, fearing the worst. Carl, however, greeted him without fear, though with sad news. Al had indeed perished in the crash, and Carl had lost his vision as a result. Al couldn't believe it. He stumbled to a mirror, dreading what he might see. Terrified, he looked at his reflection only to discover his own unscathed face. Relieved, he assumed it had all been a nightmare, as the days unfolded precisely as he had seen in his dream, leading to the same tragic accident. Al knew he had been given a haunting glimpse of his own fate, and there was no escaping it. Only skin deep. For five consecutive years, Herbert had traveled to New Orleans during Mardi Gras week, drawn by the magnetic pool of love for Suzanne. This year, however, was different. He had made up his mind to ask for her hand in marriage. As the vibrant festivities raged on, Herbert finally found Suzanne among the masquerading crowd. Unable to contain his excitement, he proposed on the crowded dance floor. He vowed to love her unconditionally, mask or no mask. Without hesitation, Suzanne agreed, and they decided to marry that very night. In their hotel room, they celebrated in the euphoria of their decision, anticipation building. But Herbert's curiosity troubled him, and he gently tried to remove Suzanne's mask as she slept. To his shock, the mask came off, revealing her face as it had always been. Confused, he woke up with a start, realizing it had all been a dream. Yet to his horror, Suzanne still wore the mask. Driven by an inexplicable force, he yanked at it forcefully, only to strip the flesh off her face, revealing the gruesome truth. She had never worn a mask. It was her face that had been hidden beneath layers of secrecy. Suzanne's agonized scream pierced the room as Herbert recoiled in horror. Lower birth. Years earlier, within a carnival, Ernest Feely orchestrated a sideshow unlike any other. Its star attraction was an Egyptian mummy, enigmatically named Myrna. Legend had it that she had once been the steadfast lady-in-waiting to a pharaoh's wife. 
the pharaoh's persistent advances had met with Mayerna's unwavering rejection, sealing her tragic fate as a living mummy. One fateful day, Zachary Kling stumbled upon Myrna's mummy along with her mystifying tale and unveiled it to captivated audiences. The carnival's allure was further heightened when Jeb Sickles discovered the lifeless body of Enoch, a two-headed man. Enoch, too, became a star attraction, and Jeb soon reaped the same rewards as Zachary. Yet, after months of silent, longing glances exchanged between Myrna and Enoch, they chose to escape together. Then, Mr. Feely, Zachary, and Jeb embarked on a frantic search, and they were led to the house of the Justice of the Peace. Astonishingly, the blind man had united Myrna and Enoch in matrimony. A year later, as the carnival returned to the town of Ozark where Enoch had first joined, Mr. Feely learned of Myrna and Enoch's whereabouts. Zachary and Jeb continued working with the carnival in their roles as handymen, while Mr. Feely, assisted by them, ultimately located the runaway attractions. Amidst this intrigue, a poignant detail was missed by them. The cries of Myrna and Enoch's child, the Crypt Keeper, a chilling legacy born of love's escape from the carnival's curious confines. Burial at Sea Barney Hogue, a man who cherished solitude above all else, had set out for a peaceful day of fishing at a secluded beach. He relished the idea of being alone with the waves and the whispering winds. However, his hopes were soon crushed when he discovered an old man already residing there. This elderly stranger claimed the beach as his own property and threatened Barney to leave. Disheartened, Barney trudged away, but as he departed, he stumbled upon a glimmering gold coin hidden in the sand. Suspicion troubled him. Why would the old man guard this desolate shore so fiercely? His curiosity led him to a nearby eatery where he deduced that the old man likely possessed more gold coins. It became clear that Barney's presence threatened to expose the treasure. He decided to return. Confronting the old man escalated into a fatal altercation, revealing the miser's secret stash, just 30 gold coins. But as Barney rifled through the old man's belongings, he uncovered a tattered piece of cloth bearing a mysterious map. The map hinted that the real treasure lay beneath the waves. Barney invested in diving equipment, eager to uncover the hidden riches. However, his quest ended tragically. His oxygen pipe snagged on a submerged marker, dragging it down upon him as he dug for treasure. Barney's own grave was sealed by his relentless pursuit of wealth. The Curse of the Arnold Clan on New Year's Eve of 1950, Robert Arnold found himself on an unexpected quest for an old costume. While rummaging through the attic of his ancestral home, he stumbled upon a dusty tome, a forgotten family heirloom. The book recounted a chilling tale dating back to 1750, a curse that had plagued the Arnold lineage for two centuries. It began with Jeremiah Arnold's death in 1750, leaving his wealth to be divided between his two sons, Jason and George, on January 1, 1751. However, Jason's greed knew no bounds, and he conspired to bury George alive, defying the will of their father. George, in his dying moments, placed a curse upon Jason and his descendants, decreeing that every 50 years the eldest Arnold would suffer the same fate, buried alive, on New Year's Eve. Desperate to lift the curse, Jason belatedly gave George a proper burial, interring his brother with a musket and powder horn. Yet the curse persisted. In 1800, Jason met his terrifying end, buried alive beneath his own home. The curse then claimed Albert in 1850, who perished in quicksand, and William in 1900, trapped in a coal mine. Skeptical but intrigued, Robert attended a New Year's Eve party with his wife Bess. As fate would have it, a game unfolded, and Robert was tasked with retrieving a musket and powder horn, identical to those buried with George. He ventured to the cemetery, only to inadvertently lock himself inside George's ancient casket. While trying to evade the watchful caretaker, the curse of the Arnold family reared its malevolent head once more. Robert Arnold, despite his disbelief, met his demise that fateful New Year's Eve, adding another tragic chapter to the eerie legacy of the Arnolds. Marvelous Verdict 
a chilling masterpiece of horror and suspense. Tales from the Crypt with its macabre tales and gruesome illustrations, these tales have left an indelible mark on the genre. They captivate readers with their wickedly clever narratives and twisted sense of humor, making them cult classics. The combination of Crypt Keeper's dark humor and spine-tingling stories creates an unforgettable reading experience. It is a ghoulish delight for those who relish the thrill of the eerie and the grotesque earning its rightful place in the pantheon of horror literature. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone!